<laughs> WET objects in the VV survey. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm Roberto and from Florianópolis in Brazil. I talk about uh, some what these objects, but uh, first of all, last year I had the chance to organize this meeting in Florianópolis, so I know there's a lot of work to do a, a meeting. So I'd like to thank uh, <coughs> Terry Lee, all the Gemini staff involved in the organization. It's been a very nice meeting, very nice place. So thank you. Welcome. Yeah, this this slide was just shown in the previous uh, pre uh, presentation, and it shows you know, this variability tree and how kind of uh, variability you can find in the sky. And in VVV, there is a lot of people trying to get you know, to transform a TSUNAM of data in the in scientific data and trying to get this variable we start from our database and, uh, and there are several projects uh, going on trying to to find that variable stars and uh, astronomers <coughs> like to put things in boxes so there is so many classes of uh, variable stars and variability and uh, it's incredible because there are some objects that do not fit any of those, uh, those boxes. And uh, we got interested in those objects a few years ago and tried to tell some history about some of these objects. And uh, if you check the first the, the paper describing the, the survey, that is that's one of the, the points was to find this unique variable stars. And at that moment, it was a bit uh, of an argument and trying to uh, check the data and try to find where are these <coughs> red variable stars. And the VV data is very useful. There are people you know, using VV data to find, for example, planetary trends. There are very thin variations. And people using this to find the uh, periodic uh, uh, variable stars, uh, transient objects, and, and the upper part of this this scale are the VVV, WIT, the VVV, what is this? And uh, I'll try to show some of them. And the first one was a object discovered by Dante and uh, there was <coughs> extreme uh, transient so we're trying to understand if the object is a cat, an alien, a baby or an elephant and mm -hmm. this object was a very red source that appeared in the first year of the observations so that's a magnitude in K band 12 uh, next year, the object appeared with, with magnitude 17, and then it used to disappear in our data. You cannot see the object anymore. I tried to stack the image to try to see in the image, but uh, we just could not observe the object anymore. And uh, at that moment, we just uh, published on a telegram channel. The object was there, was a good source, but disappeared. It could be maybe a supernova behind the Milky Way. And I tried some observations, and uh, Phil took this back on work, and there's a paper now in preparation uh, about this object. In the next years, uh, other sources appear, but uh, if you check the years, uh, 2014, 13, that means that you had at that moment only four or maximum five years of data coverage. So for some sources, the data at that moment were not enough to a good interpretation. So there's VVV02 or 3. Uh, you talk about 04, so it's 05 and or 06, late. Uh, Liz Mead just talk about the VVV at 08. And I'll talk, of, I'll talk a bit more about uh, VVV04 and 07. How about these other objects, the two, three, uh, five, and six? Uh, later, they are confirmed as a high amplitude nova in very red uh, regions of the sky. But for 04 and uh, 07, it was different. 
Well, VBB, uh, what is this was so far was discovered uh, in the middle part of the VBB disk area. And uh, I think one important uh, point to, to, to say is that <coughs> you are discovering this kind of object because we are looking for a billion object. If you survey the sky in this kind of area, looking, I don't know, 1,000 stars, you don't find this kind of uh, very unique variable. So we have a huge database. And now with the advent of LSST and other projects, we'll certainly find another <laughs> object like this one. And uh, well, what's, what happened with this object? With data covering only 2010 to 2013, you can see uh, a kind of outburst in 2013. This is are the images. Okay, you can see them all. Yes. So here are four images. So the object was in kind of key sense mode, and then in a kind of uh, outburst of eruption or a flare. We don't know exactly the time. The variation is about uh, two and a half magnitudes. And uh, later, of in 2015, we just wrote a telegram telling oh, the source is there and uh, the position coincides with a radio source. There's a radio source within 0.2 <coughs> seconds from the position of this object and the data was limited to that point. So we made some uh, suggestion that depending what will happen after that point, it could be a nova. If the decayment curve is now slowly instead it could be, or I don't know what kind of source, but you could not say much more about, about it at that moment. But there is one interesting, because the object appeared in some catalogs of uh, quasars. And quasars, I uh, assume that so far from here that can be used for astrometric uh, solution. So uh, the proper motion must, must be basically zero. And at that moment, with no Virac, no Gaia, no everything, we just try to subtract one position to the other along the years, and we note that the <coughs> position moved. Now, that is the, the total change in, uh, in Rai ascension uh, versus the, the, the date. And you can see that it's a curve. It's like, oh, the object is moving, but it's, this is a quasar. But it's, it's very, yeah, there's some variation and uh, well at that moment uh, we stopped it to work on it so last year uh, now using modern BBB data PSL <laughs> photometry virac and etc I decided to go back to the object and try to, to see what happened with, with the object and um, this is the light curve covering nine years using VVV and VVVX data. And as you can see after this, this event, it's clearly not a nova. It's not a, a micro lens because there is some variation here. The baseline is not flat. There is a kind of secondary peak here. And uh, well, let's try to, to interpret this data. And a couple of people got interested. So some people are here, then a few. Uh, Leif Mitt in spirit is here, and uh, Phil Lucas, and, uh, and also some uh, astrogalactic guys. <coughs> so I searched in the archive and I found some data from WISE, and in WISE the object was also variable. And I got uh, some data uh, in 2010 from WISE, and also some radio data. And the radio data is compatible with uh, AGN. And AGN can vary, can be variable. So we got, hmm, maybe you are looking for a variable AGN. But this variable AGN is still moving in the, in the sky. And this is not simple to understand. And uh, using Virac data, we realized that uh, there is a constraint between the moving in the, the residuals in the in the proper motions and magnitudes and a way to understand that is that we're looking for a galaxy behind the milky way and being behind the milky way the object could be blended with a galactic source and when the agn 
is brighter, the AGN pushes the centroid of the, the, the source at one side, and when we center, the centroid moves to the other point. And this is what you see in this plot. So it's a way to interpret how is that the AGN is moving in the, in the, in the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, you have also now using the colors to, to check if which color will be a, a AGN and you combine the VDD and WISE data and compare it with the results of Ivanov, Matthews, and Mitra and the colors of this object are, agree with a very red uh, AGN as expected because it's behind the, all the Milky Way disk so the light from this father must cross all the galactic disk and becomes very red. So the colors are in agreement with uh, AGN. Uh, the radio emission is compatible to AGN. So you suggested in a submitted paper that uh, our objects probably a kind of uh, optical violent variable puzzle, OBV. But uh, it's a bit weird because we do not have optical data for object. Mm -hmm. So you call it uh, <laughs> uh, infrared violent variable uh, quasar, IVV. Um, and you have submitted this paper, the Hifferi report is pretty good, and now we're waiting for the publication. Maybe it'll be in, in Astro PH in the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. Excuse um, me, Robert, can you come back to the previous slide? When you see the colors, uh, both both are from from same objects, right? Ah, uh, yeah, yes. I have we have a different epoch for VDV multicolor. So 2020 and 2015, though the the colors change a bit, and uh, but both are compatible with. Uh, it seems that the, the object is very blue, right? I mean, you see J minus K is about two and a half, but Y minus J is one. I would spend yeah. so the, the SED of this beast probably is yeah. There's a bump on the on yeah. The we part discuss there. a lot with uh, <coughs> Roberto C. D. Fernandez, who works with extra galactic stuff, but probably we are most stellar guys and uh, trying to understand uh, because there are some blue agents and red agents and try to understand if the colors are okay. So there are three works: one for Ivanov, another. Two other works that uh, show that the colors are okay for uh, for an agent. Okay, okay, and that is another interesting point <coughs> because most of the, the papers up to now are based on, on to a lot of data and for a lot of objects. And I think this paper and the next one and another paper for my student Tiago are the only three papers, the only three BBB papers for a single object. <laughs> I don't remember another paper about a one single object. So there are three papers combining PVV and DVVX data for a single object. And this is very interesting. This morning I realized this looking for some reference. <laughs> and uh, so, okay, this is our analysis. <coughs> it's very similar to this one, this called 3C279. It's a kind of prototype of this kind of objects with a large coverage by during a lot of years, from 2008, 2011, and then 2005, 2006. So the amplitude and time scale for the variability is very similar to the to the VDD one so far. So our suggestion that our object is similar to, to this class of uh, variable agents. And uh, we expect to have more behind the VDD area. And now with the VDX, much more. So maybe there's a new class of object that will be discovered in the next years. Um, the other object I would like to talk about is VVD, what this uh, was seven. This is a, a object in the galactic bulge. So you can see here the, the position of the object and the comparison between VVV and previous two mass data. So there's a good improvement in the resolution. You can see the object here, it's a very blue object behind the galactic mood. What's interesting about these objects? All the other VVV watts, these are high amplitude variables in the sense that are very bright and then start to decline, a kind of key and sense and eruption mode. And this one is a, seems to be an eclipsing object. 
similar to the object late show in the previously this morning. And uh, the object uh, now, this is again VVV and VVX data with nine years coverage. And uh, the object seems to have uh, an eclipse, an asymmetric eclipse, where about 8% of the flux disappeared. Mm -hmm. So again, seems to have something, to, if the case of eclipse, very huge cross in the star that uh, blocks more than 80% of the light. And the eclipse is broad. That is a, a shoulder with about 48 days and a narrow eclipse at about 11 days. So, uh, and this is to be the only event in this 11, in this uh, nine years coverage. There are some gaps uh, in our, oops, in our VVV data. So maybe could be some other event in this, in this position with no coverage, you don't know. There is some uh, uh, huge gaps of about uh, more than 200 years, 200 days in our light curve. And uh, you made use of VARAC data to check the proper motions and you took a look at the C and Ds and the objects not uh, so red as the other objects in the field. So probably it's not a background object, but it's an object in the foreground disk. And the proper motions are also in good agreement with that. So probably it's an object uh, in the front of the boat, you not know, in the back of the of the boat. There's some uh, data available in the literature, so you can find uh, Gaia data. There is no proper motions on Gaia, but there are some measurements. The object is near to the limit of Gaia observations. So there are some Gaia observations, uh, glimpse observations, two mass observations. So with all this data, you can build a spectral energy distribution and try to fit it, try to understand it, what kind of object it is. And we got uh, some solutions that was made by uh, Juan Carlos de Amin. <clears throat> and uh, one solution says that the object is very close to us and that's not uh, likely for this object. So the second solution seems to be uh, in good agreement with another data. Uh, in 2016, we got some time of the solar to take spectra of uh, what is this object and NOVA and we try to observe it. And uh, that seems to be a stellar source. Uh, uh, Ivanov also got some time at the NTT to observe it. So we have the two spectra. In blue is from solar and Sophie is in red. So there's some, we marked some possible lines. None of them are very, very intense it's here. There's other possible lines. So it seems to be a stellar source. There's no like a huge uh, uh, emission line like a nova or something like that. And uh, you also try it to check for periods. And uh, we've got two possible periods, about 322 days and about 170 days. But none of them seems to be very good when you try to, to phase fold the light curve. And uh, there are tentative, um, tentative periods. And you try that because uh, there are some similar objects when you check the literature. For instance, uh, Eric Mamajek found this object called the J1407 that uh, shows a light curve a bit similar to our object. There is also this asymmetric eclipse, but in that case, 90% uh, of the light is eclipsed. And uh, they try to model at that light curve. And a good model for that light curve is uh, this kind of object is a huge uh, planet with a planet with a ring system 200 times larger than the the Saturn system, and it fits the curve uh, pretty well. You can see for the title, the title of the paper is a bit uh, long, but uh, this is an object that uh, there is another two ones that are similar, now also uh, with. Uh, Asymmetric eclipse and uh, the cause could be again uh, huge structures because we have to eclipse a lot of the light. It's not like a, a planet, 
normal exoplanet that eclipses less than one percent of the light. So maybe there's again another family of uh, objects that could be discovered. Now we have GGV07, GGV80, and another object that we will uh, analyze in the future. Uh, the features in the VVV07 are also similar to, to Tabby's star. Now this object uh, in, was discovered by Kepler and uh, there's some KIC, Kepler input catalog, KOI, and, uh, and this is yeah, WTF, what, where is the flux? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is the title for this paper. And uh, the light curve of uh, the Tabby's star also shows these demons, asymmetric demons, but uh, in Tabby's star, the, the deepest one is about 20% compared with 80% of our objects. So mm. you're seeing a huge difference, but well, uh, for Tabby's star, there is not a, a period, uh, a well-established period that the, some works telling about the periods varying for four to 12 years. And um, in our object, we have told the similar period, probably we need to observe the object a bit more and try to confirm if other event of this would happen in the future. And um, there are other possible scenarios, but none of them are fully consistent with the data. So it could be a Tetauri and uh, X-ray binary, uh, low mass, uh, X, uh, high mass, <coughs> X-ray binary, or our corona borealis, but none of uh, these, these scenarios and in full agreement with the spectrum, with the light curve, with the colors. So this is an object we still don't know uh, the nature. And uh, because of these this questions, we asked it for time at SOAR and uh, we got time. And exactly this month, uh, the object uh, had been observed, uh, just received the data for the first uh, five data points. The idea is to monitor the object along the semester because if uh, the 322 period is correct, the object must uh, fall down uh, to 16 magnitudes about uh, maybe this week. <laughs> so I'm observing uh, the period is, I think the day correct is, I don't remember, 14, 15. So I ask, we ask it to observe the time twice per week along with August and then from September to October to take uh, one data point uh, per week. Uh, the idea is try to keep monitoring in order to try to understand if other big eclipses like this, that one will occur in the future. And, uh, and again, uh, Leibniz is producing literally millions of light curves and uh, he has a red show, shows some of them and uh, you probably find a lot of new objects in, in VVB in the next future. So it'll be important uh, to, to try to understand these objects <laughs> and to have some uh, follow-up program in hand because you need uh, moved wavelength uh, coverage for this object spectrum, etc., in order to understand what are seen because they are very interesting and uh, very peculiar. You cannot, at this moment, to uh, put the, the object in any other class of no variable stars. Mm -hmm. And uh, now with that, thank you very much for our presentation. Thank you very much. We actually have lot of time to thank you questions comments <laughs> questions I, I have a question comment uh, could you come back to the light curve of this the last object uh, I, I was just wondering could 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 be could this object be a, a planet a giant planet with a very elliptical uh, orbit so you're catching this this uh, object in a not normal uh, configuration, then because you mentioned that uh, the yeah, but the I think it's eight percent. Yeah, but 
<clears throat> I'm thinking on, I am thinking on a very elliptical. You know what, Karina? Yeah. <laughs> the, the the geometry. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps you have a not at a Karina, but uh, something that is crossing yeah. the yellow yeah, yeah. very quickly. Then you. But if you have a planet, I don't know. Just wondering. Yeah, I think it must be asymmetric and very large object. It's, it's too big, and because it takes too much of the planet. Eight percent. Yeah, it's more than eight so, percent yeah. of the planet. So it has to be a huge planet, and then. Yes. Yeah. Well, the, the other yeah. one, which is epsilon, which I was suggesting to Lee yesterday for his objects, the Wito Eight, yeah. is is I came across a reference to epsilon Oregi, which is one I have not heard of since I was a child, because it was written up in 1995 by Jack Lissauer, but it's like a. There's a disk which occults this F type supergiant every 27 years for two years and mm -hmm. like drops by a lot, you know. So, there are a lot, yeah, that's a, so you know, it's not pre main sequence, it's older. You know, these things, you know. another, another, uh, um, you have a uh, spectra for this object from two, yes. Uh, uh the object are they from the are they for, from the same epoch or more or less? Uh, this one, yeah. Oh, I forgot to no. let me. Uh, yes, this one. Uh, just, uh, just a second. <laughs> oh, I forgot. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the OZIR, oops. The OZIR spectra was taken here in this moment. And the SOAR, ah, here this. The SOAR and SOFI data was taken here. It's very close. Yeah, they're very close to each but other. But what kept my attention is if you take a look on the SOFI data, you have this. Huge emission lines. You see, ah, no, these are telluric. Ah, telluric. This yeah. line is oh, in the yeah, right yeah, part yeah. in the. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Telluric lines. So, um, so do not pay attention for all of this radio. Sorry. Oh, okay. So, so you're this seeing radio is uh, important, and this radio is. Bracket gamma absorption, is it there? Sorry. Is that bracket gamma absorption in the soil? Uh, no, the soil spectrum. I had a lot of difficult to render this data because the. Yeah, the resolution is not that. Yeah, yeah. But, but you you see that uh, you in both spectra you have the bracket. Gamma. Yeah, yeah. And this is typical. And um, okay. Yeah, it seems to be a stellar source. Typical stellar spectra. And you have the other bracket. And yeah. The, uh, to the blue side of the. The problem is that this region is very very extended, so that is. Um, <coughs> it will be very difficult to get an uh, optical spectrum, so you have to trust in the infrared. Any more questions, comments? Yeah, uh, Go ahead. My name yeah. is, um, what is uh, so at about 2.01 microns or something in the SOFI spectrum, you have that. I don't know, is that mm -hmm. just noise? That, um, but it's not present in the SOAR. Oh, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if it's still there is an helium line actually, this 2.03, but I don't know if this is actually helium. Uh, uh, yeah. Could be, I don't know. No, the strongest one is 2.058. So. 2.04. 2 2.058. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I'm just curious. I, I'm, I, it's strange that it's present in the spectrum, but not the Osiris one. Yes. yes. Yeah. This is interesting. Uh, same at about two point. What's that? Two point oh five, just above microns. There's some some structure in the sensitive spectrum that isn't in the SRS one. I, I I I guess there's there's quite the, the um sort of yellow lines are the errors. I'm guessing they're relatively high in these regions of the SOFI spectrum. So maybe it's just mm -hmm. yeah. You should should. Uh, definitely try to use a, a bigger telescope. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. sure, For sure. example, like Gemini. Yeah. Funny. Take advantage of our here. Okay. Uh, actually, I, I, this sort of rings a bell because I know there's been these studies of transiting exoplanets that show variable 2.058 micron emission. So that, that the 2.058 line is a is a is a uh, Fairly strongly affected by optical depth, and so you actually see variability in transiting exoplanets. Like, I'll see if I can find that reference. I just something I ran uh, ran across mm -hmm. randomly, but it might be a That's useful like spectral line yeah. to see what's what's going on with the atmosphere of the thing that is producing 
the occultation. Mm. Any more questions? Yeah, so I just wonder if you have to consider about the debris piece, because you say it's like a A type star, right? Yeah. And so I think there are some observation by Spitzer also looking around A type star and then <coughs> see very large dimming. Those okay. cannot be caused by planet because the uh, the geometry will not allow this large uh, dimming, right? So it must be something very extended and it must be. So the most likely answer would be like the radius or much extended dust yeah. cloud. Mm -hmm. I think Spira has absorbed some of them, uh, lit by Kesu. So I'm not sure if it have count cost those reference. I, I mean, no, I, I can, can send you the yeah. okay. Because I mean, no, no, a normal debris disk has an optical depth of ten to the minus three, so this must be something unusual in the disk that makes it, you know, optically thick. Yeah, so this could be. Uh, it's, so, so when people think about this, they think about something like circular. But sometimes there will be local clumps, uh -huh. and that'll be, you know, a large. Uh, it occur a lot of 